Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. On this episode, it is our annual Summer Entertainment Awards, where we discuss the best we saw in film and television over this past summer. And then after our awards, we discuss Marvel Cinematic Universe's latest entry, Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson, and I'll be your host. If you want to skip the awards and just get to Shang-Chi... Feel free to check the timestamps in the show notes. But before I introduce my co-host, I do want to make one quick aside. Normally, we don't talk about tragedies on this show, but this week does see us reaching the 20th anniversary of September 11th. It's one of the worst days in history for the United States, and that deserves to be an exception to the rule. Now, I don't know many people who don't have their own story about that day, where they were, what happened to them. For some, it was even who they lost. I still remember being at the airport when that first plane hit. I was rushing to get to a flight when I saw the second one hit. I mean, being in the airport when that happened is just something I don't think I'll ever forget in my lifetime. One of my kids thought I was dead for hours because I was headed to Dallas that day. And one of the teachers told <laughs> told the class that one of the planes was headed to Dallas. Nice job, teach. It was, a, it was an insanely tragic day, not just for Americans, but for the world as a whole. And even though panic was everywhere, we saw an unprecedented amount of heroes rise up and take charge. People traveled from all over the country, all over the world, to head to New York and do what they could to rescue anyone who survived. And we talk a lot about heroes and entertainment all the time on this show, but these brave men and women were truly worthy of capes, selfless. Brave, determined, honorable. In the aftermath, we came together in a time of chaos. Political ideologies didn't matter. Color didn't matter. Sexuality didn't matter. All that mattered was that we were all being attacked. And we were all going to work together for the betterment of all Americans. And on its 20th anniversary, I think it's important, before we get into the, the rest of the show and the fun and the jokes and the hijinks, shenanigans, if you will, I think it's important that we never forget the tragedy that happened that day. And it's equally important to remember the unity that occurred after. 20 years later, we're so divided on so many levels. It's time to remember why we came together two decades ago for the good of all of us. Because despite our differences, whatever they may be, we were still a nation of one people and still are. I just hope we never forget that unity as well. Now with that, I will get off my personal soapbox and get back into the Hollywood Outsider podcast. Again, I am your host, Darren Peterson. And joining me today are my fellow hosts, Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. I am here. And Troy Heinrichs. Meteorological fall has arrived. Pumpkin slice latte for everyone. Oh my God. Are you really excited? I got one. Cold brew. I'm not going to lie. such a Starbucks girl. No, I just pick them up for all my girlfriends. That's all. Don't hate the play. I hate the game. Hate the game. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I had a pumpkin cream cold brew as soon as it came out. And I'm going to tell you, it was delicious. If I drank coffee, I would be there with you, but I do not. Coffee? If they came out with a pumpkin spice tea, then it would be fine. He said coffee. Does that mean it's free? free. <laughs> Is that what that means? <laughs> like, I don't pay for That's it. That's what the girlfriends think every time I pick them up for them. Apparently. How many girlfriends do you have? I feel None. like we need to explain zero. the description. None. Literally zero. zero. Whenever people start with this, they have zero, Amanda. That's people <laughs> trying hard to have game. <laughs> I hate you, Aaron. Uh, it's true, though. So this is the end of summer. Like, it's over. It almost seemed like you were going to say this is the end of the podcast. Yeah, it's that too. <laughs> it's like, what? Bye, bitches. No, it's the end of summer. Summer's over. By the way, we've done this in the past. We go from May 1st to Labor Day weekend. That's what we're counting as summer when it comes to entertainment. Unless the Avengers comes out on April 30th and then we include it. But Well, we took a vote that year. You know, what are you going to do? But Marvel ruined this. So if you don't like it, if you think it starts in June 21st, well, too, no, not anymore. Marvel ruined that. That's just the way it goes. So it's officially goes to Labor Day from May 1st to Labor Day. Do you guys feel like we had a real summer this year? Or does it feel like, I mean, obviously we have the COVID thing. But it still didn't feel like a real summer. It felt like a summer to me. Did it? Yeah. 
you mean box office wise or just all around? I don't know. I just feel like this is two years in a row where I didn't, I felt like summer didn't feel like summer. It just felt like a few months with some heat. <laughs> I mean, it was really hot. First of all, in the Chicagoland area this summer. And I did go to the pool once and I went to the beach once and I went to a couple outdoor concerts during the 4th of July period. Well, it feels a little summer. I went to the movies. So yeah, it felt like summer to me. Yeah, it sounds like Aaron just needed to get outside. Maybe my life just sucks. It's really a thousand well miles done. on my bicycle. So yeah. Did you really go summer? Th- th- whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hang on, back up. You went a thousand miles on your bicycle? Yeah, from the time I got my bicycle on Memorial Day weekend until September 1st, I went 1,000 miles. That's cool. Did does you... your bum hurt? <laughs> actually, it does not. If you actually position yourself on your bike properly, you actually distribute the weight between your arms and your butt. So literally, you can sit on plastic and it doesn't even feel like anything. I don't know, man. I got a big I don't agree don't. with this at all. I've ridden my bike like around the block <laughs> and my ass hurts. I don't. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I wasn't even sitting yet. So I don't understand how this works, but... <laughs> I was still riding around like I was Those 12. are called hemorrhoids, Aaron. Hemorrhoids. No, not like that. No, those are different. Not that I it's would know. It's not that deep, apparently. <laughs> I've got a pretty <laughs> a pretty substantial derriere, and I even have derriere. those like shorts that have the pads in them, so it looks like you have like a smoking ass, like you've got like the rocks ass when you're wearing them. <laughs> and even that, my ass still hurts after about an hour. Yeah. I'm doing He must have some expensive support for his buttocks. And for when I watch movies, because movies seem to be like all over two hours now. So you have to have that extended support for sitting through the three hour picture. <laughs> do, you, do you wear your bike shorts with the pads to the theater? Because that would be kind of awesome. Anytime it's a Marvel movie, I would. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. Guy, you got some great ass right I there. I thought he meant he was bicycling and watching a movie like on his bicycle. I can picture that. Outside. And I was like, oh, don't tell Aaron this. He is so accident prone. He's going to try it one day. I would die. And he's going, yes, he's going to die from trying. I would die. Yeah. I did bicycle to the movie theater, though. I did that once. That so, yes, nice. I did watch, I did wear my bike shorts to the movie <laughs> that one time. Was it more comfortable? It actually was more comfortable, to be honest. Because we sat in the IMAX theater, which does not have the leather reclining seats. Our IMAX theater is very staunch, I guess. Straight up, no no recline. <laughs> Staunch. Straight up, no recline. I could picture you, though, having like one of those, um, you know how people have those things that hold their phone while they're, sl- while they're trying to go to sleep or whatever, hold it over their face so they can watch a movie while they're in bed, rather than just put a TV in your room, I guess. Yeah. And I could see you doing that on your bicycle somehow. I do that on the stationary bike in the basement in the winter. That's different. I'm talking like, I could see you doing it down a bike path and passerbys have to dodge you. Left and right. I mean, I could totally see that. It's no different than riding behind the soccer mom vans who have the video screen down, blaring in your face in the middle of the night that you have to try to avoid. Ugh, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> Natural selection take over. All right. So let's get into our summer entertainment awards. This is the best entertainment and each category is for either movies or TV. That's our show this week. We'll get into Shang-Chi at the end of the show because Amanda hasn't seen it. Shang-Chi? It's actually Shang-Chi. Yes. Oh, okay. I've been yeah. saying it very wrong this Nobody whole time. Nobody corrected us ever. Like, <laughs> I would think Marvel would have sent something out at some point to everybody that was saying it wrong, perhaps maybe Shang-Chi, whatever you were saying, and tell them they were doing it wrong. Give them a heads up, but they did not. It's actually like Sean with a G at the end. Chi. Sean Chi. We'll talk about that later, too. But you agree, right? Troy, that's what you took from yeah, the movie, that's exactly where. Okay. that's exactly how it's pronounced. Okay. Wow, I have been edumacated today. Thank you. Hey, think how horrible I felt sitting in the theater when that happened. I'm like, oh my God, I've just been saying that horribly wrong. And now every episode where we mention that, <laughs> like the fall movie one was only two weeks you ago. You look like a jackass. I look like a jackass, <laughs> yes. Just like when he got Tandaway Newton's name wrong before it was Tandaway. You couldn't even say Tandy Newton. Yeah, at one point I said Thandy and I felt horrible. And then somebody's like, you know, it's Tandy, right? I'm like, is it? Oh my names God. I give Aaron some leniency on because he's historically been bad with every name. And somehow he would pronounce Steve like Stave and it'd well, be that's like, that's not, a, that's not Australian you Steve. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Steve. From all the years of Crocodile Hunter, I guess. Yeah. Stevie hey, is me how you'd say it. <laughs> But uh, but when it comes to the movie title, it does suck when a movie podcast can't even get it right. <laughs> Man, they didn't put that out there. It's not like any of the trailers had Shang-Chi. You know, it didn't have any of that. It, they could have just thrown it out there. Maybe they did. And I just really, 
I was avoiding trailers probably, maybe. I do. I suck. That's all right. We're correcting it and we're letting everybody know because granted, like if we don't know, we're probably much like the rest of the general population who just also doesn't know. So I don't know about that. Maybe people. we're just stupid. Maybe. I mean, it is. Maybe. <laughs> that's possible. That's I think the many, more likely I think scenario. many people got it wrong. I hope. I'm hoping all of them did. <laughs> I'm hoping all of them that they'll make me feel better. It really, it really will. It's well, so now fun. we know. Uh, so fun. In fact, I came across an old tweet from uh, Simu Liu, who stars in Shang-Chi, and he actually kind of went through the pronunciation so Americans didn't ruin everything. And I remember reading that back in June when he put that out. I actually just sent that to Troy today. And it's got all the characters, uh, the pr- proper pronunciations of their names and the, and the actors. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> but for him, for Shang-Chi, it just says QT Pie. And I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny alright let's get into our summer entertainment awards like I said this is the best in entertainment each category is for either movies or TV so we're do, we do summer awards different and definitely this year different than we've done in some years past is each category you can pick from either movies or TV it doesn't matter across the board so either one I just want to make sure that's clear you guys understand right either one yes sir okay. I've got a blend excellent and it's the best in entertainment for that category from May 1st through Labor Day. And I can't wait to get to best lead performance because we don't break things out by sex. It's just oh, I can't wait to because also. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I don't want to give anything away. I just want to see if Troy sticks to his guns here or if he chickens out. That's what I want. That's all I'm saying. That's the only hint I'm going to give you. You're just going to have to wait. <laughs> we'll see what happens. There's some behind the scenes that happened in preparation of the episode. When we get there, we'll tell you. We'll see where he's at. I'm sure there'll be a fight in the outtakes later on. Stick around for the oh, entire Oh, it better episode. be it's in the be, normal it's episode. It's going to be in the normal episode, brother. So <laughs> you better be ready. Depends if, depends if, if a funny man over there actually cuts it out. No, well, I mean, if you disagree with me or get it wrong, then it might be gone. That's just how I do it. That's how Troy does it on, our, on the Blacklist Exposed. <laughs> Every time I'm right, I never hear it suddenly in the podcast. I'm like, wait, where was that great argument I had? I believe they say, yeah, turn about is fair time. play. Is that, mm. is that the phrase? Yeah. Okay, so first category. You guys ready? Ready. Okay. Bum, ba, dum, best team up or ensemble. That's two or more actors that were captivating to you. Troy, you can go first. Uh, I chose a very exclusive film that did release on August 27th, so it did count. Uh, was No Man of God, which was Luke Kirby and Elijah Wood. The two hmm. of them sitting in a room just playing off of each other just totally captivated the entire movie for the hour and 40-some minutes that it ran. And with the two of them, that movie would not have worked if it wasn't for those two actors, in my opinion. It was it was really great to watch them work off of each other. I did see that, and I, I have to concur. I mean, the whole movie's those two. Elijah Wood and was Luke Kirby, right? Is his name? Yep, or, Luke Kirby. No, wrong. Um, maybe it's Luke. Is it Luke? Because I'm getting every name wrong. I was about, to, I was just about to make that same joke. <laughs> Possible. You guys are so old, man. You know what, young lady? <laughs> no, it's a great. It's actually a surprisingly great it's actually, movie. It's actually Kirby yeah. in Australian. <laughs> <laughs> good, good choice. Now, Amanda, we're gonna just keep this order for the rest of the awards. Because Troy, do you want to be in the middle or the end? You choose. Oh, I don't care. Throw me wherever. You choose. Do we want to Eiffel Tower this? Uh, I can go in the middle. Okay. That, I don't understand that. That would make sense. A for Amanda in the middle. And okay. we just lean you don't know what side. Eiffel Towering is? I I don't know. Ne- this will be in the outtakes later. <laughs> no, this is going to be right here because I, I one don't- One person. I don't know. Another person. Uh-huh. And then one in the middle. I don't understand, but it's like, well, I guess because you got the A. Okay. It's like an A. Okay. Yeah, it's the Eiffel Tower. Well, that's just there's three people. Okay, well you One go you go in the, middle. in the middle. I'm gonna go get the Kama Sutra book and look this up. <laughs> you guys, you go ahead with your pick. <laughs> Everyone, beware of Aaron's Google history. My <laughs> team up ensemble choice is from Black Widow, oh. and it is Natasha Romanoff, Scar Jo's character, Yelena Belova, which is Florence's character, and Red Guardian, David Harbor. Oh, that's I fun. know what you're thinking. I probably should have included the fourth one, but I think the three of them made the best. Their their ensemble was what kept me laughing because they both just really couldn't stand how, I don't know, 
he's just very much like a dad in Nikes. Not Nikes. Uh, what are those? Crocs and socks. Well, that too. But I was thinking more like New Balance with a little <laughs> Stri- bit of... Stride right. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of like greenery on the bottom from lawn mowing. And then some oh, jorts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, God. The jorts. Oh, the jorts. <laughs> Jesus. It's a little oversized jorts. <laughs> or the Zumbas, which apparently are back in style. Anyway, they made me laugh. It was a good time. I think they had such great chemistry, and I would love to see the three of them do more together in their characters. I just recently saw somebody say, uh, I, don't, I don't remember where it was. It was like a TikTok video or something, and somebody's like, George, are coming back, didn't you hear? And they, they just smacked him across the face and said, no, <laughs> they're never coming back. <laughs> I yeah, laughed so hard. please let that die. Ah, God, that's funny. All right, good pick. Uh, mine is... Uh, only murder in the building. Only murders in the building. Mm. Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez. Those three. I, I've been so excited for this show. And and I actually want to explain that because that's detrimental to the show. That actually can up the hype factor. So when you finally see it, it doesn't live up to expectations. Exceed Especially them. if it comes from Aaron. You can ask my wife. Wait, what? That came out weird. Just so you know. When you come back and listen to that, it's going to sound really weird. <laughs> So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Steve Martin and Martin Short are a classic team. They've been friends for years and they've worked together for years. And they're very much like a Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello. They've got a great rapport. They're, they have a wonderful Netflix special. If you want to see them doing a live show together, they just work great off each other. And then you kind of throw in Selena Gomez, who plays a very straightforward, dour, modern, young person character going against these old asses as they try to solve a murder in this building And they're just obsessed with true crime. And they very much seem like people we know, you know, we're podcasters. We listen to true crime podcasts. They do too. I mean, they they just seem relatable and they're, they just play off each other so well. And they're fully formed characters, which kind of surprised me. I really thought it was going to be more of caricatures, but these are very developed characters. Even, I mean, even it's a very short run so far into the series, but it's just really wowed me. So those three. Okay, now a very complicated category, because people are still trying to understand it. Best reinvention of a cliche. Now, what that means essentially is something that's been done to death, but whether it be a moment or an entire movie or whatever, something that feels like a cliche has been redone and almost feels fresh. So that's what it is. So, Troy, what's your best reinvention of a cliche? Uh, I said the cliche that young kids are always smarter than adults, and this was rectified and made interesting again by Sonny from In the Heights, played by Gregory Diaz, because I felt like his character was always throwing down mm. the knowledge, especially during 96,000 in the pool, and then his uh, future girlfriend floats mm. up there on the raft, uh, and then just the whole progression of how he uses the, the, the money from the stuff in order to help Sonny make way for himself for the future. I thought that was a, a good twist, and I really appreciated the Sonny character in the production. That's a good one. That's, I wish more people saw that movie. I really do. Yeah, me too. It will over time. I hope it's one of those that grows on you. I hope so. Get you singing. It's a good summer movie too. It's perfect summer movie. Amanda? Definitely. Mine is Cruella, the villain backstory that makes you sympathize with them, Mm. even though they're definitely still evil. So especially with these remakes where we're trying to find a way to further the story and create something a little bit new, remaking these Corella is a character that I never in a million years would have expected any of us to understand, sympathize with, or connect to because she's incredibly mean and evil to including dogs, which is like one of the absolute no-nos in movies and television. You don't hurt animals and you don't hurt children. Those are the two things that really make us go, ah, you can't do that. And Cruella was definitely the character that did that. And somehow this film showed us someone more evil than her and took a, I don't know, they they did a different way of, of us sympathizing with them, but also still, like, they never took away from the evilness that we see later on in the original story. Mm-hmm. They just made it where you can understand where she where she was coming from in that time a little bit. That's a great movie. That's a great pick too. Oh, it was such a good movie. I'm so glad I finally got to watch it. Oh, did you watch it on Disney plus? 
Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> I counts. really wanted to see it in the theater, but... The music. Just, oh, so good. Yeah. What a great soundtrack. It was awesome. Yeah, everything was really wonderful. It was it was fantastic. Uh, mine's going to be that whole... It's not just Disney rides, but this one's a Disney ride, where they swashbucklers take it on that whole feel of the mummy. It's just, it's been done. The de- Pirates ruined it. Pirates made it a cliche. Pirates of the Caribbean did. And then Jungle Cruise comes out and everything about this movie screamed nope for me. I was on the nope boat. I just didn't want anything to do with it. The only reason I went and saw it is because my wife made me. And <laughs> it's The Rock and Emily Blunt. I like both of them. This was a, they took that formula, that tried, burnt up, just garbage formula. It's been done to death and made it fun again. They just found a way to make that whole swashbuckling and similar to the mummy in terms of special effects have been really been integrated and really just freshen it up and make it fun and make it what the mummy one was, which was just that kind of film where you had some kind of horrific elements, but you also had this swashbuckling happen. You had a great rapport going with the two leads and it just got better and better and better from there. And it's just, that's my pick. That's why. You guys haven't seen that yet, have you? No. Nah. No. That's too bad. That's too bad. You won't know how right I am then. All right. So the next one. We'll find out how wrong you are later. Best action sequence. Nah, no, we won't, Troy. We're going to find out how wrong you are. We'll see if he sticks to his guns. Best action <laughs> sequence. Speaking of guns. Huh? I have. Well, this is weird because I may even get this one kind of thrown down at me, but I, I felt like a lot of the action in action movies that I saw this summer was very the same action I've always seen. Mm-hmm. So I looked at it as the best sequence overall, which had action in it. Okay. So I said the uh, 96,000 sequence from In the Heights. I thought that, that the flow, the design, the musicality, the hmm. the choreography, the entire sequence, and it was just that mm. constant movement of the camera. Like there was action taking place and there was jumps and tricks and dancing and flips and all that kind of stuff like i I thought that that would qualify as an action sequence because it was full of action that's an interesting take on the definition this is the only one in the podcast where i'm going to give you some leniency yeah because it's a fantastic sequence it was really well it's a wonderful it was amazing lots of choreography uh and that's got to count for something and you made I feel like there's a rule. If you say it at least three times, it must be true. And that's what you just did. So there you go. (laughs) Mine is from the Suicide Squad. And it is when Harley Quinn escapes using her fantastic toe mechanism. Yes. Yes. Why why that one? Oh, it's just so fun to watch. And I think upon reflection, knowing that she did that herself, that introductory stunt where she gets the key with her toe and unlocks herself and gets herself out. Knowing that that was all Harley Quinn, well, knowing that was all Margot Robbie, doing that stunt makes it even more fun, I think, for some, for whatever reason. But oh, yeah. her character is reasons. just, oh gosh, her character <laughs> is just something that is always captivating to me. And I think anytime she does action, she, I just cannot take my eyes off of it. And they choreograph it so well that it feels like she is doing a dance and I love that when she's doing her action scenes, they like make a flowery background for her. <laughs> you know, they they make it, they fluff it up like they did in her movie. And it's almost she's like really Mary wonderful. Poppins in a way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. I I love that scene. That's a great scene. My my pick is uh, the bus chase in Shang Chi, actually, and not just because it's the most recent one I saw, because I've seen a lot of movies and a lot of TV shows over the summer. They just, they nailed that. And I have a, a, a thing where I, anytime there's kind of like a close quarters combat, it just often feels a little too fake and choreographed. And it's almost too easy to see the, te- the, the choreography. And here I couldn't, I thought it was just so well done. There's so many things happening around the sequence. There's a lot of comedy happening at the same time. It's like speed on steroids with Kung Fu thrown in. It just, it was a wonderfully shot sequence that has you on the edge of your seat the whole time and kind of blew me away. I was actually surprised because I've seen it in the trailer like 50 times. I'm like, all right, I've already seen this scene, but it was, it was just perfectly executed. Plus using an accordion bus, which I thought was fantastic. (laughs) An accordion bus. (laughs) Yeah, back and forth. That's true. I cannot wait to see this movie. I unfortunately didn't get a chance to see it, 
but I've heard so many wonderful reviews of it. So I'm getting hyped up even more knowing that it made one of the awards so soon after seeing it. Oh man, it's really good. It's really good. I was actually surprised how much Troy, like he was raving about it walking out and Troy doesn't do that about many movies. So that was something. All right. Most ridiculous moment. Oh man, this one's easy. Okay. Right. The, uh, the fast nine cars. Cause <laughs> I still think that logically you could do the swing and the swing would actually be able to be pulled off without a problem. What? Physically. <laughs> What they they would literally have to drive and hit that thing, and it would ha- they'd have to know that it's going to attach under the car, and that there's no way that works in your mind. No, wait, it's your mind. Physically, mind. it could be possible, but no. there is no way, no way in hell that the rope bridge drops into the canyon with the cars still on the rope bridge, and yet the cars seem to not only levitate but defy gravity to make it up the last ten feet to jump onto the thing. Like that was just completely unbelievable and ridiculous. So that was your most ridiculous moment? Yes. Okay. I mean, the film as a whole is pretty ridiculous, but <laughs> we did have a very in-depth <laughs> explanation of how so many things in that movie were possible by a Mr. Troy Heinrichs with science and facts and such. It's like he was on their so, payroll. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, like Vin called so, and he's like, you want to be family? <laughs> Mine I chose from Gunpowder Milkshake, Mm. which premiered on Netflix. And while I was not the biggest fan of the movie as a whole, there were many parts that I did enjoy. And this moment was just absolutely ludicrous. It's when Karen Gillan's arms are completely numb and she attaches her weapons to them (laughs) and savagely murders an entire room of bad guys by literally flailing her body around and spinning in a chair. I loved it. And I just, I think it's kind of magnificent that something that ridiculous did work and was entertaining. And because Karen Gillan, I kind of bought that this could somehow happen. Really? I mean... I mean, I kept because she didn't have her, use of her arms or hands, and I'm like, so how is she pulling the trigger on just by flapping her hands a little bit? I mean, I never understood, but I didn't care. I just like it's a really cool. Yeah, scene. you just you kind of yeah. take some of it away. You know, you take your brain a little bit out of it. I just threw it and down it's the just hallway. So ridiculous, but yeah, it's it's amazing what she gets done. <laughs> <laughs> so she massacred a whole hallway. Hmm. It's great. That's, that's my girl. Woman power, that's, right? That's something. Woo. And speaking of ludicrous, uh, my choice is the Fiero oh boy. space travel. Uh-huh. Because I don't care how many ways Troy wants to explain it, that Fiero would have burnt up to a... a <laughs> it just would have <laughs> singed. And they would be dead. And we'd all be better for it, I think, at this point. We've all wanted them to go to space. <laughs> I, I was kind of hoping they would just skirt the edges of it and come back down. But no, they went full on astronauts. And that was, I, I've i loved all of these movies. It's the only scene in all the movies where I had to stop and go, wait, this, this has got to be the line, right? The line where you just go, no, <laughs> this has got to be the line. I'm officially at the line where I'm like, just stop it. You're going too far. And that's what that line was. But they but had candy. It still technically works. It doesn't I mean, technically work. It's a Pontiac Fiero. There's no world that that works. I mean, you can make some some of it work scientifically, launching off a plane, being that high up, it gets you in orbit. But they're basically driving around. They bust through a, a, a satellite. The satellite explodes, and they just keep on cruising. Man, they're fine. They're still all good. And they're what? Are, what are they in their aqua suits? I don't. <laughs> They have duct tape deep trying to keep suits. their suits together, and they don't even yeah, well, they... meet the duct tape all the way around. It, yeah, there Come you go. On. They would I just mean, be dead. I mean, how much more was the Apollo capsule when we first went up into space? You're Not tr- much different. It was more than a Pontiac Fiero. I know that. I know the that. sure wasn't. I'm Think... pretty sure they had better than duct tape also. Decades of engineering, <laughs> genius engineering, did not go into the Pontiac Fiero. I can tell you that much because I've driven one. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe that was the intent. It was never supposed to be a car to begin with. It was always meant to be a space shuttle. You're right. Who knew? <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Only Most... the people who did Fast and the Furious 9, Aaron. That's all. Exactly. Exactly. I wish they would get back to just heists. That's when it was cool as hell. I think they're yeah. just 
try and that's to try five all day long. Yeah, that's get back to that, man. <laughs> all right, most hilarious moment, the funniest moment, basically all summer. Oh, this has to be when uh, Florence Pugh in Black Widow when she falls in from the ceiling and she infiltrates the compound and she does the move as they call it. The she, pose, like, puts her hand on the floor, and the pose. <laughs> <laughs> when she does that and she like stands up, she goes, no, that just doesn't feel right. And just kind of shakes it off and makes, sticks her tongue out like, oh, my God, it's so gross. <laughs> I laugh so hard. <laughs> That's so funny. There were a lot That's of so really good. funny moments between her character and Scarlett Johansson. Oh, I yeah. really enjoyed in that movie. For sure. Good choice. My hilarious moment was the Suicide Squad when they kill everybody they weren't supposed to. <laughs> Literally everybody at that little village. And they get to the end and they're like... We're here. And they're like, what are you doing here? Um, talking to the people we're supposed to help save. And they're like, oh, that's awkward. We just murdered everyone God, real that's, fast. That's a really good choice. <laughs> I wish I would have even. I thought of so many other ones <laughs> that were really funny, but that's a perfect moment. And I love how, was it uh, Bloodsport and Peacemaker have their kill off? We're yeah, trying to see yeah, who yeah. can kill better that same scene. Yeah. Did you see the, and did you see the that man is really funny too. Did you see the uh, Warner Brothers thing that just came out like this week where they said happy birthday to Idris Elba and called them Deadshot? No. Yes. Oh my God. Go. <laughs> they they ripped it right down and they put it back up and put Bloodsport on there. And I'm like, see, everybody knew it was the same character. Shame on everybody. <laughs> like, That's hilarious. The same character. Even Warner Brothers knew that. Yeah, they did that. That happened. Google it. <laughs> yeah, good pick, Amanda. Um, my most hilarious moment, unfortunately, a lot of people haven't seen this movie, which is sad. I, it's great. But it's called Werewolves Within. In this movie, the characters Finn and Cecily, they're heading about town. And basically, Finn is a new forest ranger in the area. And she's kind of introducing him to the, the quirky-ass characters in this town. And Cecily introduces all these main characters with a bit of her trademark wit. Um, this is She's the at t girl, as people love to call her. And a, and a tinge of small town gossip. And it's just, it's very funny and I couldn't stop giggling. And it's one of my favorite scenes of the whole summer. So. That movie is wonderful. I am so appreciative that I finally got a chance to watch it maybe a month ago or so. Oh, did you like, oh, you did. Okay, cool. Yeah, it, it was, it was so good. It was so funny and it, it had some good mystery to it if you're trying to figure out what the hell is going on, but... <laughs> You know, the characters and the chemistry and, and the humor and then the reveals, you know, because they have it is a mystery of what's really going on. And so once you figure out that mystery, it's like, whoa, <laughs> okay. it's like knives out with werewolves is what it is or potential yeah. werewolves, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. Very good video game ad- adaptation, too, if you're into that, because that was a video game. Werewolves Did anyone within. really care about the video game? That nope. was kind of my question at this nope. point, because I nope. literally nope. never heard of it. Nope. I, but I've all the gamers have been like, oh, it's a video game adaptation. I'm like, cool, man. I don't know anybody that played it, but right. cool for you. <laughs> You've probably never even played it, people. <laughs> exactly. Played Wolfenstein. Is that like a cousin? No. Uh, no. no. Totally I'm, different. I'm thinking not. Totally different. It's not. It's not. Okay. Most horrific moment. So However you define it. I saw this and I took it as like the one where I like went and like closed my eyes and like kind of cringed back in my seat. You're and yeah, that would have been the uh, the fight with Hugh Jackman, uh, hand to hand combat in Reminiscence. Mm. There was a, a part where he uses, um, I think it was a neon sign, and he takes the neon sign pipe and like stabs the guy with it. And I just kind of was like, "Ooh, that's go gross." <laughs> it was just, like both me and the person I saw the movie with both moved at the same time, like in the same direction in our chairs, because it was so like, "Oh, that just happened." It was kind of like one of those John Wick moments. Where you just go like, damn, that was badass, but good oh, I don't deal. need to see that again. <laughs> good one. That's a good choice. Mine also made me cringe and go, oh, oh my goodness, that just happened. And it is from Fear Street, 1994. Mm-hmm. And I don't, is this fresh enough for me to give a reveal? It, I won't say which character it is, but I will tell you there what you moment, of there course. You. And one of the characters in the film, their head goes through a bread slicer. Oh, God, that's awesome. And it is brutal (laughs) and awesome. (laughs) Like, (laughs) wild and also completely grotesque and amazing. Like a bread slicer from, like, a a commercial bakery type bread slicer? Like those huge ones that, yes. Yeah. (laughs) It's... It is and the head fantastic. just go like slides across and it just oh. boop, 
And then you see the aftermath, and it's like, wow. No. No. She, I appreciate uh, all of the creativity yeah. that went into this. That would have been more horrific for me if I wouldn't have been giggling the whole time. Like, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, see, that was the thing is it's like, oh, my God, it's terrible. I can't even imagine watching or being the person whose head goes through a bread slicer. But for an audience member, it's it's also really exhilarating and awesome for horror movie fans. Oh, man, that's a cover page for Fangoria right there. Right. That we're still a thing. Definitely. It was a great moment. I just want to be like the cast and crew that gets to sit there and watch it go through the bread slicer every take. <laughs> yeah. Do they do the same thing? Do they like, oh, man, that's so, but that's awesome. Okay, now my most horrific moment, I, I am going to preface because I don't want to ruin this for someone that might be wanting to watch the show. So, if, if both of you seen Cruel Summer, the TV show, I know Amanda has. I have, yeah. Troy? I have not yet. It's on the list. Ooh. Okay, you may want to take your headphones off for a second because I don't want to spoil it if you want to watch it, okay? I'm serious. Take, a, take your headphones off. No, you want to take them off. You don't want to hear me because I'm going to spoil something. Well, he's got them off that I don't think he can hear okay. us. Okay. All right. Because he only has one headphone. <laughs> All right. If you're listening and you haven't seen Cruel Summer, because it's very important, uh, skip ahead one minute. I'm giving you enough chance. Giving you enough chance. Skip ahead one minute. Here we go. I'm going to tell you. My most horrific moment in the summer is when we learned for certain that Jeanette Turner knew Kate was in that basement. Oh, my God. I was like, what the? F-? I mean, we, we kind of thought we were past it. We were over this. And bam. Oh, she said she didn't see you <laughs> she never said she didn't hear yeah that oh, was man and i, one I of got the most, shivers all through yeah me. one of the most clever twists i've seen in a show in a long while yeah that was man, great that was just that was just horrific <laughs> <laughs> you're back okay welcome back oh god okay so if you're great choice thank you Thank you for everybody that skipped ahead you didn't hear it but go watch that show because and make sure you stick around to the very very end the very, very end. Very, very end. Yes, very end. One season so far? I think it's pretty self-contained, right? I, I mean, I guess they're going to, they got renewed, but they, they finished that story. So you can feel pretty confident that the story is told. And I'm, I'm thinking it yeah, has to be Yeah, and they haven't disclosed thing. anything about the second season in terms of how it's going to relate to this first one. I hope it's not connected. So. I don't want to, I, I feel like the story's told. I don't really need It could more. be like an anthology type thing. That'd be great. That'd be yeah. great. Different Cruel Summers. Every year, different, cruel, cruel summer. All right, so best summer vibe, moment, a movie, a series, whatever, that just made you feel like this is summer. This made me feel like summer. In the Heights, hands down. I mean, it's 150 degrees. There's a blackout. They got ice cream. They got pools. Yes. They got hydrants going in the streets. I mean, it is 100% summer and just fun and singing and dancing, and you just you can't beat it. It's just amazing. I'm going to piggyback because that was mine too. Sorry, man, I'm not cutting into your turn, but that's mine too. So why waste <laughs> time in the Heights? I specifically, the 96,000 musical number is probably my favorite part, but that whole movie just makes me feel like summer. Yeah, those are, that's a, a an excellent choice. I went with one that historically helps amp me up for the summer mm. because it's a movie that I see every summer from the franchise, the new one comes out, it feels like every summer. And that's Fast and the Furious. And it's one okay. of those where you get a bunch of friends together, you go maybe see like a late showing when they used to do midnight showings or something with a big group of people because it's summer and you can. And maybe now you go to the nine o'clock because you're old. <laughs> but you just get a bunch wow. of people together. Everybody leaves there like racing, which is only something around here in the Midwest you can do when it's summertime because otherwise you spin out into a snowbank. <laughs> so that's the kind of movie that reminds me of summer. It makes me want to eat a bunch of popcorn. It just feels like an awesome blockbuster film. Great choice. Uh not like in the shade throne on the old combat. I'm just letting you know we would not go to a nine <laughs> o'clock because that's late. Because you're that not dumb by eleven thirty or something. Man, I no. Old people go at seven, maybe even five. I like six right after dinner. Showings. Four thirty right yeah. after dinner. <laughs> six is a good number. I'm with you. Technically, most of the movies were released in the month of April, though. Just for the record. But it hypes me up for summer. It makes me feel yeah. like summer. Don't stomp on her I mean, summer vibe. You this one fast. fits. This one fits. It makes her fits. feel like summer. Now you see, <laughs> listen here, mister. 
All right. We're going to come at you hard in a little bit. I was going to say, just wait, buddy. We've got like, what, three or four more until we come to you? I feel like you're trying to throw throw off people. So it's like, oh, see, see, I was just trying to do the same thing they were doing to me. No, we're going to hit you with logic. (laughs) I mean, by Marvel standards, then Fast Five would have counted with its April 29th release. But Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now, here's a category I used to put on it because it makes me laugh. Waste of your precious summertime. This is whatever it was you felt like ultimately was a waste of your absolute time. Aaron, are we going to have the same one? We damn sure will. Yes. <laughs> Troy? <laughs> and it's, a, it's such a waste of my time. I'm not even going to give it the credit it deserves to be in this category. It Wait, just what? makes me feel old every time I talk about it. <laughs> what is it? Oh, He's trying to be quippy by putting the name into a sentence. Because I don't want to talk about how old it made me feel. Oh! Shit, I'm so old, I didn't get the joke. (laughs) But now I think I'm old enough to understand, and I'm old enough to realize exactly what you mean and why age matters to you. It sure does. It sure does. (laughs) At two hours, I could have been riding another thousand miles or something. Good choice. What a waste of your night, your M night. Oh, and (laughs) and two hours on the review to write afterwards, and ugh, yes. Yeah, and you wanted to. I did. Like, I think bad reviews are actually easy to write, though. I, I, it just comes flowing out. Okay, well, Aaron, man. do you want to you want to give ours away? Because this mean, is one we kind of saw together, I guess? Question mark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we I mean, the same theater and didn't know you were there together. <laughs> kind of. It, it's similar similar times, but um, to be fair, I walked out. I didn't actually go to the very end of this thing. Which mm-hmm. never Shut happens. Up. So I, I think it's... I, I don't remember this. Yeah, yeah. I, I walked out, and I think there's probably only like 20 minutes left, and I, st- I just said, bleep, 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 this movie, and walked out. I said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm absolutely done. Now, Amanda, you saw the whole thing, so I think you should you, you should announce it. Yeah, it's still a shit movie, but there are a lot of people who love it. Oh, yeah. And that is The Green Knight. <laughs> Blah. Yeah. This one was... Actually, a movie I was in, I was really looking forward to, and I thought this was going to be a great twist on this traditional story. And I was curious on how they were going to make it work because it's so weird. But I just, there were so many things that made me go, I would rather be doing just about anything right now, including walking on Legos while I get paper cuts on my fingers. Wow. So. Yeah. What? Really not a great experience. I was just waiting to get out of there. There were visually, it was a great movie. You know, it looked nice. Beautiful. But, beautifully shot. Beautifully yes, shot. Yes. But Dev Patel is fantastic. Like great performance. Awful movie. I'm still trying to figure out. I guess I can't say it. Not that it matters because it's completely irrelevant to the film. No idea why I was there. But there I'm still trying to figure some things out. Like we did. You guys did that. You made that choice. <laughs> I know what you're talking about, and I wasn't even there for that scene. I left before that, right? You're talking about where yes. there's um, fluids involved. Yes, that scene. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm. Um, well, there is that scene, but there's also like weird, tall ghost people that you never see, hear, or make reference to again. It's just because. 20 seconds of this and then we move on like it never happened. I feel like it's right. a lot of the movie. Because you had to be high to see them when they show up later in the movie. How <laughs> high do you need to be? I was going to say, I don't think we have that much cannabis in the state of <laughs> Illinois left to get that high. Oh, my God. I'd, I'd love to speak more about it. And I know a lot of people are just going to, they're raving about it and raging at us. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I haven't been that unhappy in a movie in a very long time like i was just pissed yeah. off most of the movie i'm just like you this don't is walk so out on anything i never walk out on a movie it's probably happened i could count on one hand in my whole life my whole old life how many times i've walked out on a movie and i and it was almost over i knew it was almost over but i felt time moving <laughs> <laughs> and simultaneously <laughs> standing still I actually felt different time zones. I don't know what was <laughs> happening, but I You were experiencing felt it. the multiverse. Oh my god, I was waiting line. for Scarlet Witch to come in and just kill me already. Just <laughs> end it. End it. And I finally had to I just I'm so end it glad I pulled still water that weekend. 
Yeah. Oh my God. That was such a much better movie. Um, wow. Just wow. Okay. Let's form more positive categories because there's still got a lot of cool ones left. Best property you want to see become a franchise or a continued series. Best property you want to see become a franchise or a continued series. Either one. Uh, this would definitely have to go to the protege with Maggie Q. Really? I, think, uh, I just saw that. Yeah, that was I, pretty good. I, I mean, it, it, it very much like feels John Wick ish in a lot of ways that I'm hoping that mm-hmm. there's a crossover between this and John Wick and they are in the same universe. Cause I think it's by some of the same people. So it, it definitely feels like it could be either more multiple movies or even brought into the TV show or maybe kind of have a combination of both, but it's definitely got the setup and capability for something more. Maggie Q is one of those actresses that's been around. I remember seeing live free or die hard. I think that was the one she was in. They have mm-hmm. Timothy elephant. And I remember watching that movie going, she's going to be a huge star. And then she never was. And I always thought she should have been. And then this movie felt like, okay, we're giving her a chance, but it was in a, just the advertising and just the advertising made it seem pretty by the numbers. And I guess in some ways it kind of was, but it's so much fun. And she is great. Like she is just great in these roles. Yeah. She's, she's made and built to play these parts. Yeah, definitely. Even when she's done it in um, small TV properties that she's been in as well. Yeah. Very talented. She made that entire movie work. The one I went with is actually already a franchise, I guess, because there are three of them. But I'd love to see it continued and create a new story with a trilogy. And that's Fear Street. These Mm. were some really great horror properties that we got in the middle of July. And I loved that. I love how they released it. I love the story that came with it. I loved everything about it. So I would really enjoy seeing them do like a Fear Street trilogy each summer with a different story and try and switch it up, but give us more horror stories. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. That was kind of cool. I did feel like they were too close together, though. Like you didn't get any breathing room to build up anticipation. Yeah, you know, that's it's true. Kind of, it's almost part of Netflix's problem is they don't give you any time to actually get excited about the next thing because they just drop it all at once. And they're like, okay, well, I got it all. <laughs> it's hard, hard to want more when I've already got it. They could probably do one per month, oh, which would give people cool. time to catch up on the movie because not everybody's going to watch it the weekend it releases not everyone has time for you know maybe there's a conflict especially in summer so if you space it out maybe once a month and you have a few of them that'd be a lot of fun i think so too i'm with you um my franchise i want to happen and i'm sure probably will free guy oh yeah free guy and that I love Ryan Reynolds. I love Jodie Comer. I think more. I don't know if that's possible, but I might be close to that. Like it's, oh, it's she's wonderful. So great. They were mm. wonderful together, and I just, I just really love that movie. And I was pleasantly surprised by how much fun it was. And you know, a lot of people. I think there's some gamers that don't like it. They feel like it trashes video games. I disagree with that completely. I think it really pays love and respect to people that love video games. It's just so imaginative, so creative, so honest in a lot of ways, and just nonstop fun from start to end. I I didn't do anything but smile, and I was engaged the whole time. Usually when a movie has special effects that just continuously fill the screen, there comes a point where I'm like, all right, I'm tired. Like, all I see is stuff. Like, I'm not getting anything out of it. It's just stuff. And it felt like all the stuff that they were adding was really, it's kind of like when you're playing a game where, you, where you're watching Marvel and you get Easter eggs and stuff and you just, oh, I get that. Oh, I get that. It's like that. And that's more, that's fun. And that's what this was. This was fun. I think you can go back and watch this movie numerous times and you're going to see other stuff that you'd never even thought about the first time. I can't wait to watch it again. Oh man, so good. <sighs> all right. Now we're on to the acting categories. There's only three. Calm down. Number one, best villain. Who was your best villain, Troy? Uh, this will be a surprise, I think. I picked Matt Damon in Stillwater because he is his mm. own worst enemy. I in like this film. that. I like that. Continue. <laughs> yeah, he, he basically goes through the entire movie trying to do everything he possibly can to save his daughter from prison in a foreign country. And the more he tries to help, the worse it actually gets to the point where he actually... I guess pseudo falls in love with a new family because his family that he originally had is completely broken. 
Mm-hmm. And because of the choices he makes, not only did he lose his old family, but he also loses the new family and literally ends up with practically nothing by the end of the movie. So he does have some realizations and does grow as a character. Spoiler but at the alert. end of the day, he was a villain. He was the villain. Yeah. Too late. That's good. I like that. That's a, it's a well thought out, Troy. Good job. Mine I give you an applause. Is... Outside the box sometimes, you know. Yeah. I'll give, uh, I give you an applause, but we know what's coming and that yep. nobody else does. And it's just, I, I got to hold it. Got to hold it. Amanda. Mine is from Cruella, and it's the Baroness, Emma Thompson. Mm, I really did not expect there to be a character, again, that exceeded Cruella's evilness. And Emma Thompson is, I mean, we all know she's amazing. She's an incredible actress. And her in this just really, it's just like a piece of who she is, is to be this terrible. (laughs) Honestly, it's true. And once you once you find out, you know, all of the details and I will not spoil it for anyone, you're just like, how could you be such a terrible <laughs> human being? Like you're just not only is she awful, she's also just rude. She doesn't even pretend to be polite in many ways. So, yeah, she was but she was amazing as that villain. She was so Awful, almost over the top. Very, was it Miranda from Devil Wears Prada? Yeah. Meryl Streep's character? Yeah. Very, very much like an amplified Miranda. That's a great analogy. Yeah. I'm actually going with Emma Stone as Cruella DeVille. I mean, I know she's the anti-hero in some respects, but she's still a goddamn villain. (laughs) Come on. I mean, it's basically like two villains and she's the better, she's the one you like more because she's more charismatic and fun. Mm -hmm. But she does some, she does some pretty awful things too in the movie and she you, does, yeah. you know who she's going to become i just freaking loved crazily loved emma stone's performance that was probably the one movie of the entire summer i was skeptical about even though i love emma stone i'm like why would you do this why would you go to the well of Cruella de Vil? we've had like 47 movies on her why why and tv shows and i mean just been done to death you're not going to breathe any new life into this. And she did. Like, she made me think Glenn Close was over the top. She made me basically yep. forget about Glenn Close's performance because mm-hmm. she made that character so real and lived in and fun and awful and fun. So, yeah, definitely Emma Stone for me. Yeah, so, basically, that movie has the choice. two best villainesses in the entire uh, <laughs> summer. Okay. And it's free uh, now on Disney+. Plus. So you don't even have to pay for it. There you go. Go check that out. And you're getting a sequel. She worked out a sequel deal. Thanks, Scarlett. If and you know, here if, we go. If you know, you know. All right. So best supporting performance. Troy? I said uh, Melissa Brera uh, in the Heights. She was just captivating the entire time she was on the screen. Her singing, her dancing, her movement, the just the way she carried that role, I thought was just fantastic the entire time. She was great. Charming. Oh, the ending. Oh, the ending. Heartwarming. Yeah. (laughs) Heartwarming. Okay. Amanda, best supporting performance. Mine is Brett Goldstein, who Mm. plays Roy Kent in Ted Lasso, Mm. the TV Mm. show about Ted Lasso, (laughs) of which Roy Kent is a supporting character because the show is not about him, although he does have prominent moments. It's still Ted Lasso's show. This is and called boy, foresh- oh boy, we love this is Roy Kent. Foreshadowing kids. I'm just <laughs> so why Roy Kent? Why Roy Kent? Ah, uh, he is. He, there was an episode recently about the 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 jerks that we love, the most unlikable, lovable characters, mm-hmm. and he is the epitome of that. He is just somebody that you would probably instinctively fear would be rude to you and anticipate that happening, but also at the same time might kind of deep inside love it because that might be your person. But inside, he is such a sweet and gentle man. And as his characters evolved in the season of Ted Lasso as a supporting (laughs) character, I've really grown to want to root for him even more you know he starts off as somebody where he's like god man do you have any like chill in your body and no he does not in season one and he's evolved and he's grown like many characters do 
in a TV show. So I really, really love him. Yeah, I have to concur. My my pick for Best Supporting Actor is Best Supporting Emmy nominee, Brett Goldstein from yeah. the TV show Ted Lasso, yeah. which is where he's a supporting character in. And, and elected himself to be a supporting character. Yes, and he submitted himself yeah. as a supporting actor. Um, yeah. And the move, the show stars Jason Sudeikis because he's actually Ted Lasso. But right, right. The show that's who is it about again? I think it's Ted Lasso, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sometimes Led Tasso, <laughs> I think, but oftentimes Ted Lasso. And he is a character who usually the best supporting characters are the ones that people start talking about and they love and they love. Think Doogie Hauser on How I Met Your Mother and stuff like that. I mean, I know he has a real name, but we'll just call him Doogie Hauser. You know. It's those characters that just stay with you, that grow on you and become part of your soul. And a lot of it is because he says things that we would think but would never say. That's why you love him. Mm -hmm. And he just delivers it so wry and direct and raw. I mean, I think that's And his just, accent helps. His accent helps, sure. And the, <laughs> grr, yeah. you know, that helps too. <laughs> you know, I mean, and also what I think is important is how he's, he shows what a wonderful partner could be, should be. In terms of he he has a <laughs> surprisingly wonderful relationship with his girlfriend, a surprisingly warm mm -hmm. relationship. He actually listens to her when he screws up and he's paying attention and he's trying to grow from it. It's like he's a real person who's trying to do real life things. Right. And he's supporting the wonderful Ted Lasso the whole time. <laughs> you know, I'd like to also mention as an honorable mention, another supporting character who gets a lot of time. <laughs> No, in... we're not doing honorable mention. No. <laughs> Come on, it's helping saying, me. Okay. Well, no, no there's no honorable, honorable mentions, but if it's funny, I'll let it go. If it's funny. Well, Rebecca, the show, even from season one, has seemed to revolve around her because it's she's her lead. team. She's a lead. Yeah. Yeah, she is. But she's not. But she she's is. She's supporting. But she is. So let's move into okay. leading category because that was just a, a cheap way for you to get an honorable mention. I, don't I appreciate was trying. That. No, yeah. I was trying to make another jab at at pumpkin yeah, your point, spice. Your, your, ja your jab point failed. Yeah, failed it did. Miserably. It did. It just did. like her love life because she can't even do banter properly. Um, <laughs> don't come hey, at her. I don't think she did it improper. I actually, I'm rooting for that relationship now. I'm not going to spoil anything, but I'm kind of rooting for that. I think that's great. I, it's all about meaningful connection, not just numbers and looks and everything else it's all about meaningful connection they connect i'm looking That's forward true. to it. best I support lead performance <laughs> in a tv show troy who so, do you got so this person was submitted for their work in season one as the best supporting character in a tv show mm. and got nominated for an emmy for season one as a supporting character mm. and mm. in season two <clears throat> Seven of eight episodes or six of seven episodes that have aired have all been focused primarily on this one character, making him the protagonist of season two. Therefore, he is a lead because he's the protagonist, because that's really his story we're following for what? the most part of the season. And that is one Brett Goldstein as Roy Kent in the TV show Ted Lasso, who has not had a lot of focus this particular season. What show are you watching exactly? I'm watching the Roy Kent. Do you, do you just fast forward to the Roy to the Roy Kent parts? Is that what you do? I do, mean, I get do, it. Do you? I mean, if you watch Twitter, if you watch Instagram, if you watch, I'm Facebook, not watching Twitter watch or Instagram. TikTok. I'm watching Ted Lasso, <laughs> the, the goddamn show called Ted Lasso. I don't care what Twitter says. I realize that people are they often love supporting characters. It's called Ted Lasso. I'm watching that show every single week, and I have yet to think it's not about. Ted Lasso. Yeah, but Ted Lasso of season one was about Ted Lasso and his move to the UK and why Roy he Kent was a very prominent part of season one. Just as prominent, not just like, different kind. Not yes, like he season was. Two. Not Absolutely. like season two. He was this no, aging season... player and he was coming into his own and da 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 da, da as, as understanding that it was time for him to get out of the game, all that jive and helping him nurture, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name. Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie Tart. Tart. Jamie Tart. Do, 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 Jamie yep. Tart. And then, and then this season, it's about him realizing, you know, finding his place in the world and his relationship with Juno Temple. I'd like to interject here and also add that 
while we do get a lot of focus on Roy Kent and his relationships and Keeley, we get almost as much screen time with Keeley as we do Roy Kent half the time because of their relationship and they're often together. We also need Roy's story to have the impact on Ted Lasso, which is what supporting characters do. They interact with our main cast and they help further their stories. And if we didn't have this focus on Roy Kent in this season, we wouldn't have the direction for Ted's character that we're getting now. And I'm trying to avoid any spoilers for anybody who's not caught up on the season. No, I disagree with that 100%. I would concede it's an ensemble show, but Ted Lasso's the lead. And if 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 he's not the lead, then there isn't the lead. So no matter what, he's still a supporting character because it's very <laughs> much an ensemble show. And Ted Lasso is still the headliner. Like that's the one people try to be. They they try to make they make they try to impersonate constantly. Like so that gets traction on Twitter. Does that mean it's not true? I don't, I don't understand what the Twitter thing is an argument when I'm watching the goddamn show. I'm just saying Ted the Lasso. fans are saying like I'm watching Ted Lasso season two because of Roy Kent. No, they're I'm not. I'm not watching I Ted Lasso know. season two because Troy of Ted Lasso. Troy is saying that, and maybe you've got some Twitter fans that are saying that, but I'm watching Ted Lasso because I like season one, and this is good too. <laughs> That's what's happening. At Buy Popcorn is the Twitter handle. You can find the Facebook group over on Facebook. Go to the Hollywood Outsider. Oh, you guys can extra tell promotion. us what you, you think. Should Brett Goldstein be in the lead performance awards for this season? I think so. Because here, here's the here's the one point. Amanda was saying that technically that, you know, Ted Lasso's character is being like molded and shaped by Roy Kent this season. Not I molded and Kent shaped. Has done, That's well, not what I don't I think said. he's done a damn thing to help Ted Lasso's Ted Ted's got his own problems and he's going to the therapist in order to get that taken. Oh, care see, of. you can you do concede that there's some Ted Lasso stuff going on in Ted Lasso then, right? There's one one epi- there was like two minutes at the end of one episode and one episode where it was Ted focused this season. The entire one. show is about how his leadership and guidance is shaping their lives. Their whole team and, and everybody it. under his lineage. Yeah. But also how he is struggling with it. That's why he sought out Roy Kent to help coach the team and why he also left the field with his team hanging in the balance and another coach had to step up and take over that moment. So really he's kind but of, it's also, you've got a whole bunch of stuff about Ned. You've got a whole bunch of stuff about Rebecca. There's a whole lot. Uh, it's an ensemble at best, but Ted Lasso is the top of the pack, sir. Sure. sure you get listeners. You go ahead and weigh in on this, but I'm just saying, and and no point as much as I love that character, and at no point do I consider him the lead of that show. He's here, he's there, he's ever bleeping where. Roy Kent, Roy Kent, Roy Kent. Lead performance 2021. No. Lead supporting maybe close rant. No, close rant. actually, literally in 2021, he's up for an Emmy for best supporting actor. <laughs> so. For his work in season one. <laughs> but he still acknowledges he'll be submitting himself next year. For best supporting character because he knows he is best supporting character. He's not up for best maybe, actor. Maybe he's saying that because he can't give away what's going to happen in episode 10 yet. Oh, sure. It's going to it's going to turn into Roy Kenso. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch it. Jesus. Oh, oh my God. It's an All entire right. season of him and his uh, his niece. Amanda, who do you got? Heartbeat. Who do you got for best lead performance? Oh, I kind of forgot that I hadn't given anything for this because we've been talking about it for so long. My lead performance goes to Anthony Ramos for his uh, Uh, portrayal of Usnavi in in The Heights. Wonderful pick. pick. I loved him and he's so charismatic. And I think we all kind of really jumped on board for him if you weren't already when he did Hamilton. He was still somehow the standout for us. And he completely shined in this film i loved it and i loved him yeah i Beautiful absolutely voice. love his work in that film and hope to see him in a lot of other things he was very he almost yeah. was my winner really and in my heart he's he's still there it's very close but since you threw him out there i don't have to throw him out i try to find a way to get an honorable mention in there <laughs> i can just piggyback off yours and say i agree oh, no, man a great job great choice Love that guy. Well, he would have been my honorable mention if I was allowed an honorable mention. And since Amanda had an honorable mention, I would just say it would have been. <laughs> I didn't have an honorable mention. mention. I just tried to use that so I could try to make a jab at you and it didn't work for me. Hey, that's we should try. This I is did where try. I'm, I'm internet patting you in the head. Good job. But I chose a different person just to have a better discussion for the show. So no, you didn't. You, you picked, te- you picked, you picked him, Roy Kent, because you believe he's a lead because you're weird. 
But no, I picked Usnavi, but I saw Amanda already had in the notes, so I picked somebody else. Well, then that sounds like it's a you problem. But you still try to make a case for Roy Kent. I don't want to hear that nonsense. <laughs> just nonsense. So my my pick, which surprised me, is Brooklyn Prince for the TV show Home Before Dark. She's like a nine or ten year old kid. <laughs> Good choice. Good I choice. don't like child actors. I don't know how many times I can say this. And it's nothing against kids. I love kids. Usually for someone else's. I think those are the best because they go somewhere else at night. But child actors typically, and I'm not saying this in a mean way, but oftentimes it's very, very hard to watch their performance, especially in a TV series that goes week to week to week to week where you don't start seeing them act, you know? And I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. Like, I'm not trying to pick on kids. It's just, they're not as tenured. They're not as well-versed. I mean, there, there are exceptions. The sixth sense. I mean, he was obviously uh, an exception to that rule, but it's very rare that you find a kid actor that really takes you by storm. Brooklyn Prince and home before dark blows me away. She has, she basically pay, plays a, uh, Veronica Mars meets all the president's men. She's like an investigative journalist <laughs> of nine or 10 years old. who's trying to solve small town crimes. And she is just so riveting, so talented, so fierce. And she's like devoted to the truth and she won't stop at anything. And she just, nobody's going to tell her no. And you, and her parents are eternally supportive of this little girl. You know, even, even like in most TV shows where, you know, the parents would be like, you know, stop doing this and you got to stop doing that. No, they keep encouraging her. Like, no, you go be you. Go be the best you. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do something. Get out there and do it. And she keeps doing it. I love her performance. And this show lives and dies on her. Because if she doesn't work, the show sucks. And the show is, does not suck. It's a good show. She totally makes the show. And Troy, you're saying you agreed. So you watch the show too? I watched the first episode and then we kind of got away from it. But yeah, the first episode had me riveted and I'm just going to go back and watch it as soon as I can sit down and have a binge day because I want to binge that one and then uh, only murders in the building. Well, definitely do that. Don't don't miss out. Amanda, you'd like it too. You love Veronica Mars. I'm telling you, it's she's like a younger Veronica Mars. <laughs> she's running around solving crimes. Just a, just a great actress. And, and really one of those where you see a child actor and you're like, I want to see what she's going to do years from now. Because I think she's got a great career ahead of her. You know, just very talented. Awesome. Okay. Top five. Here's your five properties. Five to one. We'll just go round robin. Number five, number four, number three, number two, number one. We'll start with number five. Troy. All right. My first one was In the Heights. Uh, second one was Shang-Chi. Nope. Nope. We're doing five, four, three, oh, sorry. two, one. <laughs> oh, I didn't rank them. I didn't care. They're all okay. They're well, all then awesome. we'll just we'll do that. It's fine. Let's just do that. Let's just do Troy. Let's go ahead. Do your five, and then Amanda will do her five, and I'll do my five. All right. I did uh, In the Heights, Chong Chi, No Man of God, Ted Lasso, and the surprise season two of Mystic Quest because season one was badass, and I think season two held up as well on Apple TV Plus. Is that it show is really that good? It is really that good. I laugh. I laugh out loud almost every episode. I mean, if you played any kind of MMORPG video game in your life, even just a sampling of one, it it is hysteric. It is so funny. Poppy is amazing. Good list. I really got to check that out. All right, Amanda, go ahead. Your top five. Black Widow mm. in the Heights. Yeah. Fear Street. Yeah. Ted Lasso. Yeah. And Coda. That's your number one. That's my number one. Please explain. Is- yeah, please explain. Literally now my favorite movie of the year so far. And I've seen a lot of movies and a lot of movies at film festivals this year. I've seen a lot on Netflix and everything else. And I just, I was so emotionally invested in this story, which I had no idea I would be. But essentially, it's about this, this young girl who is trying to She's trying to decide if she should continue pursuing her dreams of being an amazing singer. Oh, my God, I love her voice. Or continuing to help with her family fishing business because her family is deaf and she's the one who's able to interpret. And so they kind of rely on her in many ways for the success of their business and their income as a whole because she is their translator, she's Mm. their interpreter, and for other people. And so she has that weight on her shoulders along with, well, this is not what I want to do. I want to do something totally different, something that gives me passion and makes me feel. and, And she just 
is an outstanding actress. I just the story was so moving and I I have not cried that hard in a movie since I saw the Winnie the Pooh movie. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the name of it right now. I gave it a 10 though. That was yeah, a good movie. I remember you gave it a 10. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it just called Winnie the Pooh? I feel like it had something else to it. It might not. I don't know. <laughs> but, the Christopher Robin movie? Yes. Yes. I feel like it had a different name too. Yeah. Maybe it was this is the Christopher one that you gave Robin's a 10 out of 10 that it was the greatest, the yeah. greatest movie of all time. <laughs> it's the greatest movie. Okay. I didn't movie. say of all time. I just of that, that year. year. Of that year. Of that year. She loved yeah. It. And Coda's on Apple TV Plus, right? Yes, it Apple's is. Apple's really on fire because Home Before Dark, if I didn't say that, that's on Apple TV Plus too. Ted so. Lasso. Ted Lasso. Wow. Apple's really got some stuff. Yeah, there's some. Oh, there was that other TV show that I watched, I think, last year and you just watched recently. Truth Be Told. Defending Jacob. Oh, oh defending... and Truth Be Told. Yeah. That's another one. Defending yeah, there's Jacob's some good crap. stuff on there. Defending Jacob's oh, great until the last episode. The last episode. Last episode ruins the entire experience. Yeah, I recommend anyone who is watching it or has watched it, go read the book because the ending is phenomenal mm. and they totally the just wussed out in the show. Mm-hmm. Totally wussed out. Yeah, but back to Coda. Yeah, Coda. If you, I mean, if you want a really f- good feel-good, st- it's not really a feel-good, it kind of is a feel-good story, but it's about the complexities of life and how some individuals have to grow up faster. And if you have any disabilities or someone in your family has a disability, you could probably relate to this in some way and it may have a a more emotional impact. But I think it touches everyone in some way they can relate to the story, whether they have this exact experience or not. And I mean, the performances from everyone were just amazing. I loved it. I loved it. All right. And my top five were number five, Ted Lasso. The wonderful show about Ted Lasso and friends. <laughs> Cruella, the wonderful mm. movie about awful people doing awful things, <laughs> but yep. no one hurts a dog. Wasn't that refreshing? It's kind of weird in a movie about a woman who kills dogs, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Number three is Free Guy. I just absolutely loved mm. everything about it. It was such a surprise. I was even sick of the movie before I went and saw it because of the trailers. I'd seen so many damn trailers and it still captivated me. Well, uh, it no- was like three years of that trailer. Too. Yeah, same damn trailer <laughs> over and over and over again. And then thankfully he released the catchphrase and I'm like, oh, okay. Now I'm back on board. Uh, only murders in the building. There's only, I think it's weird that I have it in my top five. Yes, because I know there's only been like four episodes as at the time of this podcast. Man. I haven't been this engrossed in a TV show in a long time. So to me, it hits all my, it checks all my boxes, hits all my sweet spots. I I love the show. Fault me if you will. And number one is In the Heights because mm. that movie made me feel something. It made me want to get up and dance and I don't do that. It made me want to sing and I can't do that. It just, I just love that movie. I absolutely love it. Good choice. And Home Before Dark would be here but I, the first season is stronger than the second, and the second's what's aired this summer. Is this your honorable mention? I thought there were no honorable mentions. Well, everybody else seemed to get one, <laughs> so is, I'm just getting uh, it in there. All right, seeming yeah. a little. Okay, fine, fine. Last category, <laughs> best. Well, you already got it now, so you can't say fine. <laughs> best summer, fine. It's now, this fine. is a TV series. Fine here. Yeah, fine. This is a TV series or a movie you found this summer. Didn't have to be from this summer, but you you found it this summer. Well, I was on vacation and I had not watched the third season of Killing Eve, so I binged mm. the entire third season of Killing Eve in one week, one episode a day. It was amazing. So good. Jody Comer. Such a good show. I love you. <laughs> She's listening, Troy. She's listening. I hope so. Amanda? Mine is, it is a film that came out over the summer, but it was also the best one that I found, and that was Werewolves Within, and mm. I found it because of Aaron. So well, thank what? you. It was a wonderful movie. I had so much fun with it. I would highly recommend you checking it out. I think it's on VOD. I don't know if it's on any streaming services yet, but... Yeah, it's still on VOD. You can pay money. It's worth it. It is. Yeah, so good. Uh, Mine is a show called Warrior, which I just found like a week ago, and I'm already like almost done with season two. (laughs) It's, It's phenomenal. 
absolutely phenomenal. It's on HBO Max, if you haven't seen it. It's, it's like a Cinemax show. It was a Cinemax show, not like one. And then it got picked up by HBO Max for season three, so that'll be coming out soon. And it follows Andrew Koji's Assam, who's this character who's a Chinese immigrant who comes to the States. And this is like the late 1800s, I believe. And it's based on these style, the stylings and the philosophies of Bruce Lee. And it's produced by his daughter as well. And it just follows Chinese immigrants as they kind of navigate the American system that doesn't want them there because they're cheap labor, they're taking American jobs, so on and so forth. But also there is Kung Fu insanity and it has some of, not some of, the absolute best fight scenes I've seen in forever. If you like Shang-Chi, better fight scenes. The fight scenes are phenomenal and they are, they feel real. They feel sure there's choreography, but none of it feels choreographed. It feels like fighting for their lives at every given moment. And I just freaking love this show. I was shocked how much I loved this show and the martial arts. If you're a martial arts fan, there's, you have zero excuse to not watch this. It's fantastic. Warrior. Check it out. You guys should sound more excited about this. I, I, I gave a real good pitch. Andrew Koji, by the way, is a star, even though it's called warrior, he's still the star of the show. There's other people that are supporting him though. I can name them. If that helps. I don't know much about this, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Fine. Just trying to make a nice. I have day. seen. I have seen glimpses of it as like a recommended thing you should watch. I just never checked it out. So now I'll, I'll add it to my list. All right. You want the listener picks for the top ten? Yes. Of summer, I bet you Ted Lasso is going to be on there for Ted Lasso. Yeah. Nobody called it uh, the Roy, Roy Kent Kento. Uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> nobody. Nobody. Number ten. Surprisingly, <laughs> Leverage Redemption. Oh wow. Well, well it's because you put ten instead of five. Sure, but still, I mean, I'm surprised it's in the top 10, honestly, but that's great. Good. Yeah, Leverage Redemption was a lot of fun, especially if you're a longtime fan. Uh, and if you're new to it, you can watch it and you don't really have to have seen the original show and you still enjoy it. Number nine, The Suicide Squad. Mm. That's the one with uh, Bloodsport. <laughs> Not Deadshot. Which spelled backwards is Deadshot. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight is Jungle Cruise. Number seven is Only Murders in the Building. So I'm not the only one who's got it up on high on the list pretty pretty soon after it came out. Number six is A Quiet Place 2, which we didn't oh. talk about. Oh. It would have been really close on my list, too. Great movie. That- it would be in my top 10. Yes, it would be in my top 10. Was it after May 1st? Yes. It was. Mm-hmm. It was right around the time Cruella came out. Same weekend, I think. It was Memorial Day weekend. It was the same weekend. Yes, I just said that. But yep. thanks. Number five, <laughs> number five Black Widow. I was Widow. supporting you. <laughs> what a dick if I was Black Widow number four nice. Shang-Chi I just want to point out Shang-Chi is already leapfrogged Black Widow Black Widow's been out since July yeah that was not hard that was not a hard thing to do no offense sorry wow. Scar I, Joe. I like Black Widow uh, number three I Florence Pugh she was great <laughs> number three is Free Guy number two none of us have mentioned this show not once yet number two is Loki it was on my list of my top five properties, and then I took it off to add In the Heights on. I was I was in between, though. I really, really, really liked Loki. I was very meh on Loki. I know everybody loved it, and they kept raving about it. I'm like, it. it's so okay, you know? But apparently it's number two for everybody else, so. I I'm didn't see wrong. it yet, so I could not comment. What? I can only review things that I have seen. Huh. Well, Loki used to be a supporting character to Thor, and then he got his own show. So now he's the lead. So it's his show now. That's how this works. Maybe that's why I haven't seen it yet. I can't wait for Roy <laughs> Kento, which might come next year on Apple TV+. Plus. Speaking of, the number one show, by our listeners' counts, Ted Lasso. And all of them also said, we love it because of Ted Lasso. <laughs> Every comment says that. <laughs> Every single comment said that. He's there. <sighs> he's every f and where okay well that's gonna do it for that portion of the solo that's our award so ooh, thanks for listening now we're gonna move to shang chi and the legends of the ten rings but amanda has not seen that so amanda we will bid you a fair adieu thank you for joining us amanda goodbye and good night people this was a terrible way to leave <laughs> <laughs> the best part is she waved she made sure to wave on a podcast. I did. <laughs> now we're moving.
moving on to Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. We're going to talk about the spoiler-free bottom line. Troy and I both really enjoy this film. We're just going to talk a little bit about it in terms of um, spoilery. But for people that have not seen it, I'm just warning you ahead of time. We're going to be spoilers open. Simu Lu takes on the titular role of Shang-Chi, who known to his friends simply as Sean. When we first stumble across Shang-Chi, he is casually joyriding his way through life as a parking attendant by day, karaoke beast by night, with his best friend Katie, who's played by Aquafina. Both are underachievers, and Katie's family remains forever disappointed in her perceived wasting of absolute potential. That all changes when Sean is attacked on a city bus one random morning, and his true lineage comes crashing out. See, Sean, a.k.a. Shang-Chi, is the son of Wenwu, played by Tony Leung the bearer of the legendary Ten Rings, which contain an unbeatable power that has allowed Wenwu to rule the underworld with an army of assassins for centuries. And after a family tragedy causes him to regress back to his maniacal ways, Wenwu takes or tasks his son with a per- personal assassination, which then caused Sean to, to flee from both his father and his little sister, Xia Ling. The remainder of the plot is that Shang-Chi is needed to thwart an attempt to destroy his deceased mother's homeland of Talo, an enchanted realm where Asian culture meets mysticisms. Issues between his family and his underlying culture culminate in a bombastic battle between mythical creatures, enhanced ninjas, and more radiant light than has been seen since the conclusion of The Last Dragon. So <laughs> that's going to be the description. I hope that covered all the bases. Now, Troy, this was a brand new hero for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He is officially an Avenger. They did say that he is an Avenger now. What what do mm-hmm. you think of Shang Chi and Simu Liu's portrayal? Uh, I love anything that deals with Asian culture, especially anything in the mysticism realm or dragons in particular. And I just loved, and I just think that you know where Black Panther was really really great, and it was just super fun, and you know it just delves into that you know African culture in a lot of ways. I think this did the same thing when you think about how it plays into mysticism and Buddhism and, and everything that is with Eastern religion. And I think that it was really fascinating to see how they did the, not only the progression of the story in the real time, but also how they delved back into the past to give you enough of the backstory. And I think the way that they did the backstory was like really well done where it was placed versus being very exposition and giving it to you all up front, kind of Lord of the Rings style this was really great how they dropped it in where it mattered so that you could understand the story as it went along. So what do you think about him though? Like the actual character of Shang-Chi? I mean, I- I'm watching this movie and this is a character I didn't know anything about. I didn't read the comics. It's, it's new to me, you know, and, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, there are different things that are yes, no, that weren't in the comics were in the comics. I don't know what those things are. All I know is that I was Really entertained by Simu Liu's performance. He was extremely charismatic. He really just, like, as soon as he hit the ground, he hit the ground running. I think that's very hard to do because when you think, you mentioned Black Panther, when you think back to Black Panther, you know, he got to pop up in Civil War. He got to, pop, like, establish himself in another franchise. Shang-Chi doesn't get that. He has to start from scratch and really sell us on a brand new character, which they really haven't had to do since the initial. MCU. And that was, that, that, so I would think that's a little bit harder to do. And I think they nailed it. I think he really caught us in, in his grasps from, from the get go. Would you agree with that or? Yeah. And I think that it's probably a benefit of the movie too, because you don't have any preconceived notions coming in. I mean, the, the end game is done where we are, where we are. It's five years post snap, I believe in this movie. And I think that where we're at, is just really trying to understand What is the state of the world? And we get to understand the state of that world from a very plain, ordinary guy who goes to a very plain, ordinary job who doesn't have a lot of money. His partner doesn't have a lot of money in Aquafina's character. It's just there's a lot of things here that just make you feel like, oh, these are average people. And when you think about what Marvel Comics tend to do, it's take average people and make them better than average or more super when they really weren't super to begin with. So to see him just not really use superpowers in this entire movie, he's using pure skill to accomplish what he accomplishes. I think it's really fascinating to watch his journey go from, Hey, I'm just this guy with a backstory that not not a lot of people know about, but as the, as it progresses, he grows through the film himself into the character that he was always training to become when he was a kid. 
Yeah, but he does get superpowers by the end. I mean, he gets the but, ring. Yeah, because so, the ring yeah. says it, yeah. Right. But I did love how, you know, instead of he finds it within himself or anything else, like he just learns how to control the environment and kind of recalibrates the rings. Is that essentially what happens there? I mean, he basically yeah, just... they change color when they are in his possession versus his dad's possession. Right. It's like, those are mine now. Thank you. You know, and I thought that was very smooth and, and magical. He was, it's a character that I didn't know much about, but now I walked out going, I, I could spend the next decade with this guy. I could follow him on his adventures for the next decade. I'm sold. I'm on board. It's hard to do. I think when you have a franchise like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where you have so many characters people already love, you know, now this guy has to come in there and try to take screen presence away from Doctor Strange and the Hulk and other guys that are that are part of that. And he did it. Like, already at the end of that movie, I care way more about his world than I do Doctor Strange's or most of the other existing Marvel Universe. Even though we see a lot of Doctor Strange's world in this particular film, which True. is very interesting. Yeah, because Wong's very prominent in this movie. and Very prominent, that's, yeah. That's fine. But I'm not a huge fan of the multiverse. I, I've said that many times. I don't love that idea. But I love what was done here. Mysticism and Asian culture was represented. The martial arts were fantastic. I, I'm, I love martial arts, especially when they're done well and they don't look choreographed. And it was it was beautifully done throughout the movie, and he's a wonderful artist in that respect as well. I think that's important. One of the fun facts about this particular property, when you look at the comics, the Ten Rings are literally Ten Rings, and they can shoot lightning bolts and do all this mystical stuff from the fingertips. And when they were in the writer's room, they were actually watching old kung fu movies, and there was one movie in particular where the guy was literally wearing bracelets doing the kung fu moves, and it was at that moment that the writers actually said, oh, that's how we're going to do the Ten Rings. And they changed it from finger rings that shoot lightning bolts to truly be incorporated into the Kung Fu fighting style for this film. And I thought that was a great change. It really worked really, really well. Yeah, visually something to watch, too. Yeah, for sure. Now, how do you feel about Aquafina as as the partner, Katie? And I guess she's she's not really love interest, but also kind of at the end. I mean, you got the feeling that they love each other, if not. At romantically as best friends then. I mean, I'm not quite sure. It's very undetermined at this point. Yeah, I really liked, you know, because we're in spoiler territory, they joke about when are you guys going to get married because they're at her house with her parents and her mm-hmm. brother and sister, cousins or whatever it was. And they're just a um, really, really good team together. And I think that as the story progresses, you realize that she'll do anything she can for him. And he's obviously going to do anything for his family. And she's part of that family by extension. So at the end of the movie, it's really interesting because the end of the movie starts at about the exact same time uh, as the start of the movie. And when they're at the end of the movie, it's not like they're a couple. So, but when uh, Wong shows up to get them, not only does he take Shang-Chi, but he also takes his partner. And because of that, they go together. And I think that's really good because they're a team. And I'm interested to see where the team goes and how that progresses through time, kind of like Captain America and Peggy Carter. Yeah. And I I was really fascinated because I think Aquafina is a good actress, a very good actress. The Farewell is a great movie. You should watch it if you haven't seen it, where she actually gets to do a lot of dramatic fare. And, you know, I was worried for about half the movie. I'm like, so is she just going to be comedic effect? Like she's just going to be the sidekick that makes cracks and that sort of thing. But then in the back half, they really gave her a purpose and she, you know, she takes up archery and she, she wants to contribute and she's not going to just be the romantic interest or anything like that, or even just the, the friendly sidekick, you know, she's not going to be Lewis and Ant-Man, you know, she's going to be part of the action and she really delivered. And I'm glad because I was really worried for about half the movie that her character wasn't going to be a, a fully realized character. And I'm glad that they were. And I kind of like where the romance is too. It's very open-ended. So you can kind of, you know, ship them if you want. Don't ship them if you don't. Yeah, and she might have been one of the people that you would have said is a, one of the cliche categories for our summer movie awards that we just finished up. Sure. For the uh, cliche of people that need to stay here that never stay there. And I think because of that, <laughs> like she would have been the one that redefined it because that moment was so great when she didn't stay put. And what comes of that at the end, because she doesn't stay put, I thought was fantastic. Yeah. Like a true, like a true best friend. No, you're not doing this on your own. I'm going to help. Right. You know, I like that. I love that a lot. Now, Tony Leung is a very, very famous international actor. And Wenwu is 
a villain that is kind of a villain that we've seen before because it's basically he's the real Mandarin. You know, Trevor was the the fake Mandarin, which the decoy, which is some great comedic. Ref- uh, effect and and I did like they brought Ben Kingsley back for some jokes, especially when he faked his own death. That was that was hysterical. But in terms of of as a villain, you know, some people are saying he's one. Of, he's got to be one of Marvel's best villains. Some people are saying he was he wasn't really a villain. Like, where are you on Wenwu in in terms of the character and the performance itself? I guess character wise, I think it was fantastic. I really liked his perspective on the fact that he was trying to basically take over the entire world and everything that he did. At the same time, he understood that there was more to life than power until that life was taken from him. And then he went back to his old ways, mostly driven because of the way the entire story unfolds with the mysticism that the rings obviously have a way to connect with some evil spiritual power if used for the wrong purpose. Um, And and I think just that progression of the character I thought was really fascinating to watch because he he might not have been necessarily a bad guy. He was just misunderstood, turned into a pretty decent guy and actually did some good with what his power and empire had built only to see it all crumble around him as he just drove for his one main purpose, which was to get back the love of his life. And so the range that um, Tony brings to this, I think is really, really fascinating. And one of the best villains in the Marvel universe, I think, I think that's challenging to say but I definitely like the depth of the character because it made the character feel real. And like he could have actually been an Avenger himself had he had more guidance and direction from a group of friends to lead him down the right path. Yeah. I mean, he spent a thousand years conquering. I mean, he's definitely, I guess he qualifies. I mean, if there's like a, (laughs) like a job program, a placement program, yes, he qualifies as a villain. But by the end, I mean, it was painfully obvious that he was just, you know, he, he, misled. Had, yeah, he's misled and he tried to his best to reform and he was a different man. He was trying to be a different man. And then he lost his focus. You know, he lost his chi really. I mean, it's it really what it is. Yeah. And all he wanted was to get that back. I mean, that's all he wanted. And he really believed and his mind was, I think, fractured because he lost her and how he lost her and how it re- he reverted back and then he lost his children. I think his, he was trying to convey that he was a fractured man who had lost his children and now he just desperately wanted to get back the love of his life because maybe she would make everything right again. I mean, everything was going well in his life until she passed away and it was his fault that she passed away. And, you know, this this monster, this darkness really seized on that and swallowed his soul, so to speak. And so he paid the ultimate price. And what's, what's funny is this is one thing that I did love about his arc. He doesn't actually lose. He Right. He, he is a he, redemption story in a way. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a redemption story. And he kind of lets himself be the victim in order to let Shang-Chi find his place and his path. And he just lets it go at the end once he realizes what a fool he's been. You know, he's very prideful, but he understands at the very end, wow, I I did all this. This was my fault. Here you go. Do what you need to do. And then he sacrifices himself, essentially. I kind of like that versus, you know, I I couldn't see any other way. He really brings his dad down because his dad was ultimately very powerful. But then he, you know, he coaxed the rings back. And I think his father finally realized, oh, you're in the right. I'm in the wrong. It's time to go. And I did like that he never didn't love his children. He always loved his children. He just, he was, he comes from a different world and he's lived a long life. He's seen a lot of different things. Yeah. And I think that in the end, because of the sacrifice that he makes and gives up his soul, that it's almost to the point where he does accomplish his mission too, where he now can be reunited with his wife, uh, especially with the way that they do the, um, you know, I forget what they're called, but the, the light lanterns when they, you know, pass both his mom and both the, both the wife and him are both side by side in the, in the light lanterns going into the lake at the end of the movie. I thought that was really good. Now, any other supporting characters that you think stood out or didn't work for you? Uh, Ying Nan uh, is the aunt played by Michelle Yeoh. Uh, I think that she was fantastic. I think she was a really good spiritual guide. I mean, it's all almost kind of a, a bummer at the same time because she's kind of like, I hate to say stereotypically put in these kind of roles, but she's a master though. I mean, she's, she's a master at the craft. Absolutely. And, um, because of that, I I thought just the journey that, uh, 
she walked uh, the kids on because she's the aunt. Uh, that it was just really great to learn about Talo through her and just know what the actual ultimate bad person was was through her story and explanation of why Talo existed in the first place. I think she really brought some heart to the movie and just the purpose of what they really had to accomplish. So I think adding that in really helped save the movie because it, it was the, you know, fighting some bad guys that are trained to be martial artists and in major cities on the bus thing. Yeah. It's all fancy and flashy and fun, you know, but there wasn't really any heart until you get to the whole Talo sequence and understanding what they're really trying to protect, which is humanity yeah. at that, re- at that regard. And to piggyback off the family mo- mode, um, Shia Ling, his sister, I thought she was a great martial artist. I don't think she got enough to do character wise, but I do kind of love in the post credits that she's kind of putting the Mandarin's crew back together. <laughs> you know, she's getting the whole League of Assassins put together. But her which, fight, which is curious. This, hang, hang on, her fight on the scaffolding yeah. though was probably. I love that fight. I thought that was so well choreographed and it was just beautifully done. But what were you going to say? Sorry. Yeah, with with the ending, I felt like it was like badass. But I also felt like she was a little dark at times as a character as well. That I'm wondering if she's a villain. Given that Florence Pugh's character in Black Widow was approached by the Baroness, and we saw the Baroness in Winter Soldier, like does she end up becoming a bad character and teaming up with the Baroness with her army? I wonder if that's where that's going to go because I just felt like there was just something a little bit cold about that, like. The organization still being up and running in the in the post credit sequence when she shows up. I don't know if you got that same take or not or same. No, feel. it could be. I mean, at the end, she's putting together the assassins, so there's definitely potential for that there, right? There's definitely potential. Yeah, I mean, I don't know anything about the comics, so I don't either. I'm sure somebody's shouting at their radio right now. Uh, the only thing that really bothered me, character wise, when was henchmen were super lame. <laughs> like, super lame, except for guy with detachable arm. Everybody else was disposable. They were just like. You know, henchman number one, henchman number two. It was like you're playing Batman Arkham Asylum. They were just the guys you're fighting and trying to get combo kicks on. Uh, we, we already kind of talked about the action and the set pieces, but how do you feel about the mysticism in the MCU? You know, you've got, you have a full on dragon fight going on in this. And at the end, you know, the first two thirds of the movie are very much, I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of mysticism, but most of it is straight on martial arts choreography. And then you got the last third, which is heavy into mysticism and dragons and just like mythical creatures and all kinds of things like this. Like, how did you feel about that? I thought it was probably, I mean, I always thought, I mean, I'm not a fan of the Hobbit movies by any stretch of the imagination, but smog I thought was really well done, especially in the high frame rate. I was like, wow, that's a dragon. Right. But then you, you, you see things in Asian culture and Chinese culture specifically and you play games like uh, Breath of the Wild, Legend of Zelda. They had some really great. Dra- and you're like, what does a dragon really look like? Is a dragon more like a dinosaur or is a dragon more like a long serpenty worm? Um, which this was definitely more of the what we would picture dragons of the Chinese up to be, which would be in that more long elongated worm like state where they can do things like create tornadoes of water and vortexes and trap people and just their almighty power. Um, just with their tail and how they flick it through the air. I think, I think the depiction of the dragon I thought was fantastic. I thought the, yeah. um, I don't visual effects, CG, whatever you want to call it. I was like, that dragon was real. It was so well done. <laughs> and even, um, I don't want to call it a dragon, the evil, bad monster thing. It was probably more like a serpent than a dragon. That's fair. Um, yeah, that's fair. But, but, um, yeah, even that was just like fascinating. Like the, the soul sucking and the throat throbbing. And it was just like, Oh my, like, what am I watching here? This is just, wow. Fascinating stuff. I, I have to say, man, because I, I really didn't care much about, I'm just not big on multiverse. So Dr. Strange and Scarlet Witch and all that stuff, the light shows and those and Loki even, you know, it just doesn't do anything for me. I don't know why, but this works better for me. I, I just felt like maybe it's because it felt like there's more heart involved. It felt like there's more of an emotional connection with, the family dynamic, all of that just just led me to really enjoy the characters and the world a lot more than I do in the other Marvel stuff that's happening right now. Like I, I was really engaged by the end. Yeah, and I think it goes into the whole Marvel property and Marvel concept of like there are other things out there that we don't know about. 
Yeah. Um, especially when you get to the mid credit sequence with the beacon and this is truly saying like, Hey, why are we fighting each other as humans? We should come together as humanity on earth because there's bigger things to worry about. And this definitely goes that way where the 10 rings army finally joins forces with Talo to fight off the evil that is coming. And I think that's really what Marvel stands for. And I, I really appreciated it in this film. Although it was the one point in the movie where razor fist is like, okay, yeah, we'll team up. I was like, that was kind of a corny line. Yeah, it was, that was pretty forced. That was pretty forced. And the, yeah. the post credits with Wong that to me, that's, that means that Shang-Chi is going to go fight in Dr. Strange and the, Multiverse, right? In the multiverse. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense that he would be either in part of that movie or some other way um, where they they show up in Eternals, potentially. Ah, uh, could be. Eter- the, yeah, it could be Eternals. Sure. Right. Because this beacon or whatever that's calling out could be whatever the Eternals thing is trying. The Eternals are supposed to protect us from. So it could be related that way. So there's there's a lot of good potential. Like I was nervous for what this phase of MCU is going to be. And I would say at least for the next three years, I'm really actually really, really intrigued on what's going to happen next. Yeah. I was concerned with the n- new characters, especially new characters introduced that didn't have any launching pad. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have a civil war to kind of get them going. And especially in the pandemic, man, I really thought even if this movie is great, is it going to catch on? And it was, a it's a massive hit. Marvel can't apparently cannot fail, cannot fail. Yeah. It's the difference between having people that understand the concepts that they have and the works that they can pull from in order to tell great stories. And I think the people over on the star Wars side should really take notice of what Marvel's doing because you still have time to save star Wars, star Wars. They need to kidnap Kevin Feige and just put him in a room and say, fix our, sh-. just fix get him it. in a room with Jan Fav- John Favreau and let them figure it out. Cause I think those two guys just got the best brains to, to make that click, you know, which pseudo happened obviously with the Mandalorian, but, Sure. But I'm, I'm very excited. This is, this is a character, like I said, I could follow for the next decade and I was not expecting that after this movie. So I'm, I'm stoked. Both him and Aquafina. Oh, absolutely. And I I hope they're together. I like if he pops up in an Avengers movie or somebody else's movie, I want her there. Like she, she feels, and it feels natural. It isn't like Natalie Portman, you know, as Jane in the Thor movies where I'm like, why is she right. still here? She's not contributing. And I know she will in the next one, but she wasn't really in the first couple movies. You know, it doesn't feel like it's just an afterthought. Like they actually put some work into the character and she's going to contribute and be part of it. She's part of the heart. She's part of the action. She's really going to matter. And I, and this is going to sound weird, but I love that she's not a natural looking, like she doesn't look like every other Hollywood actress. She just doesn't, right. she doesn't look perfect. She looks normal. And that's not, that's not a negative. That's really not. Like, I think she's a pretty, pretty woman. It's a breath of fresh air. Like she's all glammed up and everything else. She just looks like an everyday person. And I, I like that. <laughs> I just like that. I don't know how else to say it. I just like it. Yeah. So if $10 is a full price for mission, what do you give Shang-Chi in the Legend of the Ten Rings? I'd give it a solid eight fifty. I felt eight like bucks. it dragged in a few places to make it a nine, but it was super enjoyable. And I was really excited the whole way through. I'd go watch it again and pay 15 bucks to go see it again, except I'm an A-list member. So it doesn't really matter. I don't know if it would be as engaging on the big screen or on the small screen as it is on the big screen. There's just some movies just pop. Yeah. The dragon sequence has to be seen in IMAX or at least Dolby Atmos. I almost want to see that one in 3D to see if that dragon comes at my head. The tail will for sure. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's going to do it. We're going to get out of here, but thanks everybody for listening. Remember, you can go to the Hollywood Outsider dot com for everything else on the podcast we'll be back next week with a new episode we're gonna have a fall tv preview and that'll be fun and troy thanks for joining me always glad to be here super time go see it go see chung chi it's amazing yes in the theaters you can't get it on that disney plus right now i sure can't somebody was trying to order it all week and they're like what the hell is this shit i got 30 bucks burning a hole in my pocket you can't watch it go to a theater And remember, the next time you go to the theater to see Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings, buy popcorn.